Okay, folks, I've just been given the signal that we should go ahead and begin. So officially, hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to Rocking Those Mocks, Dancing for Change. We are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University's fourth space, where we collaborate with our university community to activate the various projects, initiatives, and conversations ongoing across the university by creating daily activities. So to that end, it really is our pleasure to collaborate once again with our colleagues in the Office of Indigenous Directions to welcome you in for this conversation this afternoon. Okay, that's it for me to get us started. It's my pleasure to pass the floor to Indigenous Events Coordinator in the Office of Indigenous Directions, Aidan Kondo, over to you. Aidan, hello. Thank you, Anna. Um, so, Gwe M. Setwen, hello everyone. Welcome to this year's third, uh, not this year, the third annual Rock Your Mocks event for of the Office of Indigenous Directions. Um, before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyan Gahaga Nation is recognized the custodian, uh, custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather here today. Georgia is histo historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it's a home to diverse populations of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with past, present, and future in, in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Now to introduce our moderator for today's event, Dr. Bimadoushka Pukan is Anishinaabegwe from Saugeen First Nation on the eastern shores of beautiful Lake Huron. Saugeen boasts the most awesome sunsets this side of the Ottawa River. Here Bimadoushka <laughs> recounts stories of her people long past but that continue to live on as we tell our sacred stories. So I guess before we have uh, our panelists join us, I'll just have a little dis discussion with you, Bimadauska. So uh, since in the theme of uh, Rock Your Mocks, tell us what your, your moccasins mean to you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome out in the Zoom world and welcome to my guests here in Fourth Space. So thanks, Aiden, for introducing um, me. My moccasins are super special. Um, you can't see them right now because you're focused on my face, but uh, my moccasins are made especially for me uh, by some folks out west, a husband and wife team. Um, I shared a dream I had about what I wanted my new dress and my new beadwork to look like. I explained to the beadworkers and to a dressmaker separate occasions described the things I saw in my dream and I asked them to um, separately, right, the dressmaker, please make me a dress and then to the beaters, please do me some beadwork. Um, my dressmaker is from Sagamuk. Her name's Lynn Smoke. Fabulous, fabulous dressmaker. Uh, so yeah, the um, when my moccasins and leggings came to me. They came at the same time um, as my dress. I opened them both up and took a look and believe it or not, they both match. So I dreamed of a pink flower um, that looked a little strange, but I also dreamed of blueberries. And so both my dress, uh, the dressmaker and the people who beaded my moccasins both managed to produce um, items that go incredibly well together. They match perfectly and the dressmaker and the beaters did not ever have a conversation with each other. So they're really special to me, one, because I dreamed about them and that I told my dream to a gifted person, an artist, um, and that the artist was able to make these and they match exactly like my dream. So there's some kind of strange connection that exists between, um, you know, between people, especially when, you know, we are honoring um, our traditions, especially our power to dream. And it's our ability as Nishnabe to dream of the future, to dream of a new world. And it's also our respons responsibility to uh, make that a reality um, right here in the physical world. So the artists help bring my dreams into reality and I'm absolutely grateful to them and I couldn't have beautiful shoes without those gifted people. So that's why my moccasins are special to me, but they also go everywhere with me. I dance all over the place. And this summer I went all over Southern Ontario and I also got to visit um, some places in the United States. And I was so excited by everything I saw this summer. I saw people doing new things, dancing in new ways, wearing really cool and exciting new outfits. 
but also I saw people entering new spaces. And that's what got me really excited about being let out of COVID and that we could go back to powwowing again and being together and celebrating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I love my moccasins. Thank you so much, Mudashka. That I think that's the perfect way to start off our today's event. Thank you for sharing that. And I believe that our panelist has uh, arrived. So uh, to introduce our panelist, Lauren Giles is a multidisciplinary artist, regalia maker, and dancer hailing from Ganawage, Quebec. She has undergrad uh, background in theater, powwow, and burlesque. In 2022, she was awarded titled Miss Exotic World and is awarded as one of the most, uh, regarded as one of the world's most influential burlesque artists in the world. So everyone. Hi, bye bye. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. Oh, wow, this is loud. Um, my name is Lauren Ashley Gazitsunoto Giles, and I'm from Gunawake. I am Mohawk uh, and Black. Um, and yeah, I am a regalia maker and dancer, uh, and a multidisciplinary artist. So I thought I would come here today, and I would like to thank you for inviting me into the space. It's really beautiful to see people in person, as you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, just to talk a little bit about my regalia making practice and, and what I am against practice, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, I grew up in my community. Um, we moved, my parents were military, so we moved around a bunch when we were kids. And we moved back to my mother's territory uh, right after the Oka crisis, so in 1991. Um, and I moved back home with my grandparents, uh, and I was raised primarily by my mother, my grandmother, and my four aunts, so all women. Uh, and it was only after I left the community that I realized uh, things that not necessarily I didn't take for granted, but I, I didn't consider how fortunate I was um, to grow up in the community that I grew up in. Uh, our culture is very tied uh, to our day-to-day -day life, to our academics. Um, I went to school on the reserve and um, crafting, uh, moccasin making, soapstone carving, uh, basket making, those are all part of the curriculum. Our stories are part of our Mohawk lessons. Um, so yeah, I realized that this is something that not every um, Indigenous person gets to experience firsthand. So later on in life, when I was pregnant, I started um, around 2026. 20, I had a friend that was like, we should dance together. Uh, I know that you do other types of dancing and theater and all this stuff like that. She goes, have you done power dancing? And I said, no, I, I haven't thought about it because it's, uh, you know, it's outside of my comfort zone. So she's like, I'm going to train you. And her name is um, Ivani and she's a beautiful, uh, the power community is very small. So I don't know if anyone knows Ivani, but just a beautiful fancy shawl dancer. Uh, and through her, I met MC. Um, and other people that I reconnected with, Barbara Daibo is another dancer that is very uh, important to me and also for my community. So through this group of women, they were teaching me dance while I was pregnant. Um, and I was tuning into all these old practices that I had from when I was a child that I never thought about using, right? Like beading or sewing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just show you a few different pieces that I've made over the past 10 years, <laughs> um, if that's okay. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it didn't really give me a format. <laughs> that's all right. No, I get excited. <laughs> okay, so. I love power gear. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> you all online can't see how nice this is, but she's going to show, hopefully you get Close a good look eyes. at it. it it's deadly. <laughs> okay, so because I'm Iroquois, we use a lot of our traditional clothes in ceremony. If you go to longhouse or harvest festivals, you're expected to wear a ribbon dress. So I wanted to do something that's floral. Um, and I did like a box pleat and a princess. If anyone's a sewist, it's like a princess cut um, with the ribbon. So I'm going to actually pass this stuff around to show you um, if you want to hold it. So this would be traditionally worn uh, under um, a long velvet beaded skirt and moccasins. Um, and yeah, I think my style is a little bit more contemporary. I really 
enjoy getting inspired by different things. And there was a photo that I found of my um, of my mother's family, uh, and it was from the 19th century. And it was a beautiful photo of my would have been my great great grandparents and their brothers and sisters. And there's about 15 members of the family, but they're all in ribbon outfit, uh, ribbon uh, traditional outfits, but they're Victorian ribbon traditional outfits. Ooh. And it was really beautiful. So I was like, I want to make something like that. So I made a two piece. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, again, um, so it's using kind of like a broadcloth cotton. Um, and I put little Victorian buttons on it, and then the skirt, again, has these ribbons at the bottom. That's so. amazing. I love how artists are able, I'm not an artist, <laughs> but um, how do you manage to bring these beautiful colors together? Oh, I love, I just, so I always let things speak to me. Um, it sounds really hippy dippy, but I'll find, a, <laughs> I'll, I'll find a, a piece of fabric, and I really like dark colors. Um, and there was like these beautiful pinks on it. So I just created like a palette of pinks and reds. Um, and yeah, my, <laughs> my aunt, people are like, how did you get into sewing? I started sewing when I was five. Um, my aunt is a seamstress. And everything I, I realized, a lot of the stuff that I do was out of necessity. We grew up quite poor. Um, and my aunt needed somebody to help her cut up patterns. So she taught me to sew when I was five and I became obsessed with it. So we could, I'll pass this around too, I'll maybe on that sure. side. Um, and yeah, I'll show you the first pair of moccasins that I ever made. Uh, the first pair of moccasins I ever made were a powwow style mock or a Sioux style mock. Um, and this is the first powwow I danced. So I was maybe one month postpartum. I was so tired. Wow. <laughs> and I was making all my regalia, not sure if anything was going to fit. And I was like, I need my mocks. I need to make mocks. So what was nice about gathering with all these dancers, all these women, is once a week we would get together and we would share regalia making tactics, how we would do things and try to figure things out together and storytell and gossip and all this stuff like that. So it was just really beautiful because I was also picking up these techniques and I was worried because I was like, you know, I don't have like a nice beaded set. And they're like, do not worry about that. Just get out there and do an applique set. So an applique set is all, it's not beaded. So these are the, these are the first leggings I ever made. So I'm just showing you, they're just like, like this. And then zip around here. And then you have a Sioux style moccasin. These are quite beat up. And you dance powwow, so you'll appreciate the duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to pass these around just to show kind of the, the evolution of that. Um, and yeah, during COVID, I think it was really an interesting time because we were really cooped up in the house. And uh, I have a tiny apartment, or just my daughter and me. And we we're trying to figure out ways to stay in, like, Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, so I was telling her about like teaching her art, traditional dances, um, women's dance, and shuffle dance, and alligator dance, and we would just do it in the apartment. And I was like, you know what? I just like, do you wear these moccasins when you when you dance? I said, well, no. If we're doing our traditional dances, we wear our style of moccasins. So an Iroquois style is something like this. So this is the second pair of moccasins I ever made. Um, I really like doing things the hard way. <laughs> And I wanted to do a monochrome moccasin. So I did all this raised beadwork on black velvet with black leather. Um, so you can kind of see things that make our style of beadwork a little bit different than uh, Sioux style or like even Métis beadwork. Um, each tribe has a significant, like a different style. So we're known for our raised beadwork and our floral patterns. Um, and traditionally, like you do a vamp. So that's the top part. And then you do a back vamp here and you attach it to the moccasin. So I'm going to pass these around. There are two, so one for each side and you can kind of see the difference between the first and the second. Oh. <laughs> uh, and then I started to get really comfortable making stuff and having fun with my regalia. So when I dance powwow, I dance fancy shawl. And it's really a dance um, that is a very, um, 
like peacocky dance, right? Like you're really showing it's a, it's a beautiful dance. It's a fast dance, very athletic. Um, and yeah, it just beautiful, beautiful regalia. We dance with these giant shawls with ribbons all over them. Um, and to hold down your shawl, you have something called a yoke, um, which I during well, before the pandemic, um, I took six months to lead my yoke. So this oh my is, God, that's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. this is the yoke that I beaded and this is the front of the yoke. So this holds down my shawl. Now for my regalia colors, I was really inspired by a sunset. Um, so it's lots of purples, reds, and oranges. And I wanted people to know when I was dancing which nation I was from. So I incorporated sky domes into all of the floral motifs. Um, and there's some dentalium uh, along the edges here. I just love the look of dentalium. Also, it was a way to fill space a little bit faster than beating off. <laughs> but they're very expensive too. The yeah. Dent. Yeah. And it was also a new, a new material to work with. So each time I make a new piece of regalia, I try to differentiate it from stuff I've done before, but I'm also learning new skills. So dentalium are shells and there's a way to treat them, right? So you soak them and you file them when they're wet because it's quite dangerous. Uh, the dust can get in your nose and it's quite dangerous. I learned that the hard way. So we'll pass this around. My history students are here, so they're all nodding <laughs> on over this in class. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's more pieces of this regalia. So this, another thing about powwow dancing, um, again, I, I'm, I apologize because I don't know what everyone knows. So if I'm repeating anything, my apologies. But um, I was gifted some eagle feathers a few years ago, and eagle feathers are very important, and it's a great honor to receive them and you have to take care of them um, especially when you dance because if you dance at powwow and it falls off we stop our powwows and there's a ceremony to pick it up and depending on the powwow you might not get it back um so there are all kinds of tricks that we use <laughs> to keep right. these feathers stuck to our head so the back of my barrettes i i work with a lot of leather and that's another thing in my practice i try to use really um as traditional as I can get with with my materials, so I use a lot of leather. Um, I try to use um, reclaimed leather. So a lot of my friends will donate leather and furs to me, which is really I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so this is the back. I have two clasps in the back, so that goes um, when I braid my hair here, and I keep the back in leather because duct tape actually adheres really well to leather, and I duct tape my plumes up here. And then I pin it so it's not going anywhere. It's like stuck to my head. So then you can kind of see the, the colors there. Uh, and yeah, I, I have really, I, I've made regalia for other people, other dancers. Um, and it's always such a beautiful process because I try to really get to know the people that I'm working with. Uh, if I take a commission on with somebody, um, I ask them to tell me about where they're from and what they're like, what colors they want and what the significance is for them. Um, because regalia really is like, it is another storytelling component and it's also an identifier, right? There's so much pride um, in what we do. And one of the first things that I was told when I started doing POW is you're dancing for people that cannot dance. Um, and that's why it's important to be presented well, right? Like you're representing not just your community, but like your elders and like, you know, what you dance, jingle dance, uh, people give you tobacco. And the reason that they do that, it's quite beautiful is because they believe our prayers go right up to Sungwai Adizu, their, our creator. So yeah, there's almost like a, a responsibility and a duty. It's not just a, a vanity practice. It's it's quite beautiful when you think about it like that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about something that's like um, maybe not powwow centric. <laughs> no problem. So um, my other dance practice, uh, I, well, I have a few. Uh, I dance with a contemporary indigenous company, uh, but for the past 17 years, nobody do math. <laughs> Uh, I've been working as a burlesque dancer, um, and when I started doing burlesque, I was uh, the only Indigenous burlesque dancer in the world. <laughs> What's that? And what is that like? It was, I mean, 
I focus mainly on doing like um, classic burlesque, so like gown and glove, like really retro 1950s, like high glam performance. And it was really, really great. Um, but I always, um, you know, there's again, coming from a community and my worldview about dancing being one medicinal and then also a responsibility of representation. Uh, it's important that people know where I'm from. So uh, I started to win titles and become more well-known and headline shows. And um, it was great. Um, and it is still really, really good. But I, I mean, I've been having this practice for almost two decades. And I created a piece that is really uh, political uh, and it's really intense. And I took that piece to... Um, burlesque call of fame which is kind of like the olympics of burlesque if you can imagine it there's about five thousand applicants every year and there's 10 dance spots so um i was selected to compete for miss exotic world which is the highest title in our industry and i won with this piece so thank you awesome. um and the piece is is really jarring and, and it's all about uh kind of lateral violence against indigenous women in our bodies and the, the war on our bodies um, and taking that back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very conceptual piece, <laughs> but the visuals also had to like match the tone of the dance, right? So there's like several dance styles that I was incorporating. Now, in traditional burlesque dance, it's very high glam. You're dancing in heels and corsets and gowns. Um, so I had kind of a mixture of everything, but I wanted all the reveals not to be body reveals, but to be cultural reveals. So at the beginning of the number, I'm in a purple robe that goes down to the floor um, and I'm dancing to a tribe called Red. So it's like, this is like, it's all like powwow drum. There's a heavy, heavy drum. So I start um, doing like a powwow like a step, like a crow hop step in this gown. Um, and then the first thing that comes off, I have my hair tied up and I have braids that go down to the floor. Um, the second thing that comes up is I open the skirt and I see that I am not in heels, but I am in moccasins. So these are the last pair of mocks that I made. So these are the boots. Um, they've, there's been a glow up. So there's <laughs> beatering on the edge, mainly applique. There's painting, there's rhinestones and like, a little pop of color for me just because I like it. Um, but I'll pass those around. And then these are other pieces. So this is the one of the mocks right here. Uh, this is another piece that's about. So can I ask? Yeah. Um, how is it? Difficult, or let me see, how do you maneuver between this traditional space of what sort of we have this idea of what culturally what an indigenous woman is, yes. and then this other space um, that's new and exciting and <laughs> yeah. cool, but how, yeah, how do you oh, move between those two? Oh, well, not gracefully all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a journey. And I think that at the beginning, when I was starting to become more renowned on an international stage and, and recognized, um, I did need a little bit of pushback. Um, and it was, I found, mainly from Indigenous men. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And I was taught to listen to elders, so I always listen, and I did internalize a lot of it, which was, you know, it's hard to get critique on your work, it's hard, but I want to make responsible art, and I want to make art that moves people and that, that maybe can change something for somebody, but then I thought about all these things that inform my practice, um, and just my overall view of dance, right, dance is medicine. And we dance for people that can't dance, right? So like through burlesque, there's not any moment of weakness in my dance practice. Everything that I do is from a place of power and autonomy and control. And I'm very fortunate that I have done that work and that I can speak those, like, and, and I've processed like the trauma that I've experienced in my life, but not everybody has. Not every woman has, not every uh, two-spirit person has. So in a way, I am also dancing for people that can't do that. And I'm showing people that it is okay to exist in both worlds, right? Like I am a mother, a daughter, a wife. I'm also 
a sexual person. I'm also, I, we're all multifaceted people and there's no shame in loving your body and in, in expressing yourself through dance. And, and there's a real freedom in that, right? Um, and I think that people may confuse liberation with disrespect sometimes. Right. <laughs> But there's nothing disrespectful in the way that I uh, in the way that I I, I dance. Um, so yeah, I think that just having open conversations with people, and I'm always welcome to have those conversations. So I'm like, you don't have to enjoy what I do, but I would love to talk to you about it. And I'd love to take you on a dance class. <laughs> you know, I um, so I will show you the last pieces of the regalia that I made for this piece, because again, I wanted it to be. Uh, you know, one of the statements was uh, beating over rhinestones, beating over, you know, I wanted to really show that. So this is a corset. <gasps> and I beaded the whole thing. Wow. Um, and the ribbons kind of explode. This is like a trick. They tuck into these panels here and then they explode when I'm standing on a fan. There's a box that's so fast. So then it was a really beautiful visual. Um, it was quite challenging on um, technically just because uh, this is steel boned corset. So uh, I had to wow. do applique work. Uh, so I'll pass the few first and then yes. we'll go around. Um, and, oh, and it's heavy. Yeah, and this is the bra. So you can wow. see. And then this is. Okay, so That's this is heavy. the underpiece. There's a body harness, and that goes right there. <laughs> nice. But yeah, so I really wanted to to create a piece that, um, yeah, again, when I dance, whether it's powwow or contemporary or burlesque, I want you to know where I'm from. I want you to know what clan I'm what, what clan I'm from, what nation I'm from, which reserve I'm from and you can see that in like these kind of things I think we talked about a little bit about why we pick the colors that we pick yep. and um yeah. so yeah I I hope that paints a picture a little bit of my practice and this is the last thing I think this is like one of the first big projects I did when I was I did this I when I was probably 16 I never finished it like the back isn't finished but this is a crown and this is what we wear uh in ceremony so you see, and then I, it's like raised beadwork and like two birds. So I'll show you that. beautiful. Wow. Yeah, I love that raised beadwork. Yeah, it's really hard to master. I'm not an expert in it by any means, but um, yeah, you can kind of see the progression of that. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, identity right there's that there's you the individual mm -hmm. but then there's also the collective identity oh yeah that, that space <laughs> as well that how about um yeah what's it like with the being with the community i guess being with the commu yeah um it's really interesting uh kind of I, I, yeah I'm looking at is it difficult kind of yeah because again there's like, like now uh like in different fields too right like i in the burlesque industry now there are there are so many indigenous dancers and that is really really cool um so i'm kind of like an anti-figure in the burlesque world awesome. which is really awesome. really cool um because i still feel like a baby i still feel like okay well i'm just like figuring my own way but like i get a lot of um other indigenous dancers that i um talk with that I kind of mentor through difficult spaces because regardless of what type of dance you do, I think existing as a person of color and an indigenous performer is really difficult, right? Like we enter a, you know, some of these spaces and it's, it's hard, especially if you're doing something that is presenting like culture or something that is, is important. You wanna feel safe. You wanna feel that you're able to, and sometimes dealing with producers, right? Like, Right there, there's all kinds of minefields to navigate. Um, and then I get on the other side, a lot of settler uh, performers and producers will come to me to kind of ask, hey, is this OK? Hey, um, how do you feel about uh, land acknowledgments? Uh, when I was in Vegas competing, uh, 
the day before the competition, the organizers came to me, they're like, hey, Lou, we would really like to do um, a land acknowledgement. And I'm like, that's great. I think that's wonderful. Um, and again, these are the producers that are making or breaking my career. <laughs> so I'm trying to also be diplomatic. And they're just like, well, what, what should we do? And I'm like, well, I think you should absolutely um, take it seriously. Um, I'm like, if you can do research and like, you're in Nevada, so maybe there's like, I think there's eight different tribes that straddle that territory. I was like, find an elder in that community and go and talk to that, that person and see if you can get somebody to come in. I'm like, and don't just, I'm like, and bring them something, you know, make a donation, do something uh, actionable. Um, so they're like, well, we don't have time to do that. So I was like, okay, well, let me talk with all the other. So I rallied and I got every other indigenous dancer that was at this dance competition. And we were about maybe 15, 20, 20 women. And I said, well, what are we gonna do? What do we, what do we wanna do? And they're like, okay, well, let's, let's let, let us give the land acknowledgement. So we, we gave, we stood on stage and it was a really beautiful image in Vegas at this casino, the curtains open and there's 20 indigenous women like shoulder to shoulder. And uh, we gave a land acknowledgement, um, but then we talked about performativity <laughs> and they weren't expecting that, but they gave us the mic and we're like, okay, well, this is what you have to do. You have to like, this is a nice gesture, but we need action behind these gestures or else they're empty. Um, That's right. So we were able to get the, that organization to donate like I think like $2,000 to different indigenous organizations that were Nevada specific. And that felt like a small win. Um, but I will say that dealing with these things, I always preface this where I'm like, look, I'm just a girl <laughs> from Gunawage, like I'm Mohawk, I do not, like, and like, this is my worldview. Like I, I grew up in this territory on the Canadian side of the border because our territory extends, you know, so I was like, um, I can't speak for everybody. I can't speak for everybody, but I can give you my opinion. And as a Mohawk woman, if anyone knows anything about Mohawk people, we are, <laughs> we are matriarchal and our women are quite, uh, quite tough, quite strong at times. So, so this is just my opinion. So yeah, I, I do feel it's, it's quite hard because you're kind of expected to be the expert on everything sometimes. And I try to lovingly tell people that that's not the case. I can't give everyone their answer. I can give you my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. Awesome. So were you, um, were you at Concordia's first powwow this year? I was not, I was actually performing. I was, I think I was in Los Angeles that weekend, but I'm coming, I, I <laughs> intentionally I'm coming to, I want to do the McGill and the Concordia powwow. Oh, week. I didn't know McGill had a powwow, but mm -hmm. I know Concordia's powwow is going to be really deadly <gasps> next year. Um, it's going to be, there's people coming from all over Turtle Island. They're going to descend on Montreal and we're just going to like dance. What? so hard and fast that the smoke's going to rise. <laughs> do, you, do you see smoke fans? <laughs> no, but I really try hard, but I'm terrible at it. Oh, okay. I'll You'll have to teach us. I'll tell you a fun story. Okay. Um, so I work with uh, an indigenous contemporary dance company called uh, Anawarda, and that's like headed by uh, Barbara Gaparumi uh, Daibo, who is from my community. She's this amazing, prolific dancer and just a kind spirit. And she brought me into the company uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my age um, <laughs> at like 32 years old. She's like, I want to, I want you to come and dance for me. And I was like, well, Barbara, respectfully, I don't have a background in contemporary dance, and I'm like, I'm not gonna start training contemporary dance at 32 years old. And she's just like, I have faith in you, and I want to train you. So uh, for 40 hours a week for like three months, I went and we trained wow. and. We did this beautiful show um, called Sky Dancers, and it's all about uh, the Quebec Bridge disaster, um, which directly affected Barbara and also directly affected my family. Um, so we have our relatives that were lost on the bridge. Um, and yeah, so I'm just kind of like also dancing with a bunch of 20 year olds. <laughs> uh, there's so much humility and just showing up and doing it, but I was really happy to, I was just happy to be there. And I was like really excited to learn this new skill. Um, so then Barbara goes, well, I'm gonna open the show with a smoke dance. I'm like, that's nice. And she goes, you're gonna do it. <laughs> it's just like, absolutely not smoke dance. It's so hard, it's so hard. Um, and I, I, I open that show every time with a smoke dance. 
Awesome. Uh, and the first show, one of the elders from our community, <laughs> Sedalia Phillips. I don't know if you know her. No. She's great. She's a firecracker. And she was just kind of staring at me the whole time. And I was just like, oh my God. I, I, I knew that she was like eyeballing me. And at the end, she was like, you're really good. And I was like, okay, this is, I got it. <laughs> so maybe I'll, maybe I'll dance smoke. Awesome. <laughs> maybe I'll come yeah, and dance smoke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for all the cool stuff happening here at Concordia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we have a Powell here on campus now. Um, and then also I wanted to ask you, is that, were you on APTN? I was, I was, yes, they did a, they, I was during the pandemic. That was a really cool thing. They asked uh, if they could uh, do, they're doing a series uh, spotlighting indigenous dancers. Uh, so they, I, they did an episode on me uh, and that is on APTN and it showcases um, my burlesque stuff, but it's like, burlesque light because it's on tv so i remember when we, were, when we were filming it at the height of the pandemic so they, they rented out like a the museum of natural history in ottawa and they transformed the stage into this beautiful sound stage um and it's the first time we're all meeting we had been zooming and like like basically getting this together for months and then it's film day so there's hair and makeup and all this stuff and i go on stage to do the number and they're like Ooh, uh, you can't do that. <laughs> I'm just like, okay. And they're like, can you keep that on? So I ended up just a very modified version of, of the routine, but it was fun. <laughs> awesome. I also saw um, a Vice video. Yes. Yes. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was, I think, yeah, I, I've, I've, I always had the mindset of if somebody has a question, I'm just going to share my experience because hopefully that helps other people elsewhere. And like I, at the time that I think was when I was getting a lot of like kind of pushback from, uh, from not a lot of people, but there was like, you know, you hear one or two negative things and it kind of sticks with you. And uh, it was something that I really wanted to address. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really, I think that we're, again, multi-faceted people uh, and you can be like, have traditional values and hold yourself with respect and also, you know, do these different types of dance, right? They're just different forms of expression and they are all valid and they're all saying different things. Um, and that's really just like the power of dance, right? It's carrying a message. So yeah. that's... That's awesome. I love that. I just want to shout out to our in-house community. Does anyone have any questions at all? So if anyone wants to ask a question, just wave me down or wave at Aiden and he'll bring the microphone over. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah, we do have a mic out there. Hi, Hi. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> I was just wondering if uh, your um, the, the the competition that you won, was it posted on YouTube? It's going to be. It's going to be... Um, Probably in November, December, because yeah, the the next competition they're opening up registration at the end of the year and they start to slow release the video. So I will definitely be posting that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so just oh here we go to another question out there. Uh hi, good afternoon. Hi. I was wondering uh for the making of the moccasins, how much of the process is ritualized and also how much time does it take on average to make them? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand, uh, by virtualized? Uh, like a... Well, I mean, is there, when you're making them, do you make them with a specific mindset or is it like you would make any other dress or any other item? No, um, okay, yeah, so, uh, I don't, I don't like, picking up beadwork when I'm stressed or when I have bad feelings. I don't like putting my energy into it's like cooking. I, <laughs> I don't know if anyone grew up with that. You shouldn't cook when you're angry. Um, I really like to be in a good mind and I like to be at peace and I like to be around people that I love when I'm doing, because there's so much energy that goes into this work. Um, yeah, so if I'm doing it for myself, sometimes projects will take years. Sometimes like I'll bang it out if I'm like, <laughs> You know, if I really am feeling like I need to finish something for like a, a powwow or, 
a ceremony. I can, I, but yeah, beadwork definitely different than sewing. Sewing, I am fast. I can do stuff really, really quick. I can do a dress in a day. Um, but beading is it, it'll it happens when it happens, <laughs> and as long as it happens. And I also notice a difference between doing commission work. Um, during the pandemic, I didn't mention this, but I started a small business called Sky Woman Creations. Um, and I was doing like earrings and hats and purses and stuff like that, um, just kind of to make ends meet because I wasn't performing. Uh, and it was fine for a bit, but then I, I started getting a lot of demand. And I think this is true with most people that do any kind of commission work. There's not a lot of us that take commissions. <laughs> so you, you'll have a list of people waiting. And um, I just started not to like the process as much. Like, I like the... I like things coming to me and I like being inspired by stuff. I don't like the kind of pushing things out to push them out. Um, I will say that applique is easier than beading. Like, so the, the, the Sioux style moccasins, I showed you the powwow mocks and the last pair are applique. Beading takes time and it is very laborious. I have admittedly not beaded a full set of Sioux style moccasins because it's so much work and I know the way I dance, I'm very hard on my feet. So I just keep thinking, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do all this work and they're gonna be like one season and done. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm sorry, I kind of ramble. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, just like, uh, yeah, the, the types of material you're using yeah. will yeah. change the amount of time it takes. But even to like coming up with a design, like I find that's the hardest thing is the design. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also really cognizant of not, um, I do this in dance too, where if I'm going to create a piece, I try not to look, like if I'm, if I'm going to create a burlesque piece, for instance, I try not to watch burlesque for like six months. I try not to go to shows. I try to just like create in a vacuum almost mm -hmm. um, because I try to be respectful of other artists. I think that it's, if you're constantly surrounded and it's very easy to be inspired by other things and it's, quite scandalous to show up with the same colors or beadwork as somebody else in the house. Yeah, we don't copy. No. There's, there are no two matching outfits out there. Uh, even when I commission people to make um, things for me, if the design I give them matches something they've seen before, they'll tell me, no, I'm not making that. I'm yeah. going to have to change it. And uh, so it's, yeah, we, we don't replicate. We don't copy anybody else's things. It's very unique in our our artists, like it's important to us that we, mm. we maintain that within like the cultural art that we do. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, but they, I guess the same, it, it's, it moves into the burlesque with well, you too, that same any, kind of, right, that, of the worldview, right? Yeah. That we have to be unique and present ourselves mm -hmm. in that, right, that in a way that reflects ourselves to the universe, Absolutely. right? Like it's part of that creation. Um, yeah, well, I think that it goes back to our names too, right? Like in my community, um, I was named by my grandmother, um, and she, my grandmother was not traditional. My grandmother was Catholic, but she gave me a Mohawk name. So I have a, a, a weird relationship with my name because I will not change it because my grandmother named me and it, it's my connection to my grandmother. But our traditional teaching is that no two people can have the same name because when you're praying to the creator, if the name is the same, it, the medicine won't go to the same person. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have a, my Mohawk name is Gazi Tsunoro, which means uh, precious flower. And it's actually quite a common name in my community. So out of respect, I'm not the oldest person with that name. So I don't use my Mohawk name. But amongst my family, I use my Mohawk name. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I have a weird relationship with my name too. Well, you all know my name's Bima Dashka, but... For most of my life, I never used that name. Mm -hmm. um, I was named by my grandfather. Mm -hmm. and my grandpa was a hereditary chief. Um, and I was the only one, like I was born in the 70s. And back then, nobody had in, a native name. Mm -hmm. Everyone had English names. I was the only one that had the name, Bima, like had an indigenous name. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to school, the teachers couldn't spell it. They couldn't pronounce it. There was always a million questions about what does that mean? And, and tell us about your, and really it's none of anyone's business what my name means. Um, and so I stopped using it and then I didn't have to answer so many questions. But then when I was at school, like in grade school, I also experienced a lot of racism. 
Um, and so my dad's Ukrainian and my mom's Nishnabe. And I look brown. So when I go to school, my cousins, right, my indigenous cousins and my friends, folks from the reserve, they would tell me, oh, you can't, you can't play with us because you're white. But the white kids wouldn't play with me because I was brown. So I ended up really kind of like always left alone or whatever, you know, big bully or whatever it was. Um, but I would go home at the end of the day and I always went home to my grandparents' house and my, I would tell my grandfather, I don't, want to, I don't want to be an Indian anymore because they don't want me to be a part of their club anyway. Um, and I said, so I'll just go be nothing. And my grandfather spent a lot of time with me after that. He put me in the car, he drove me all over my territory, pointing out different land formations where battles happened, where people fell in love and got married, uh, where people are buried. So he really taught me to respect my land and love my history. But then he also taught me about my name. So my name, Bima Dashka, means laughing water. But I'm also named after a woman from the late 1700s, mid 1800s. Uh, Bima Dashka was a white girl. Um, we, she was found abandoned in the forest. Um, our runners at Saugeen, the messengers brought, found her in the forest. They brought her back to Saugeen. She was raised with us. And became a part of our nation, spoke the language. Uh, and Bima Dashka, this woman had a, had a love for the beach and she's buried there at our beach. So I was didn't like that name because my grandfather named me after a white woman and my community would never let me forget. My friends would never let me forget this fact. But when my grandfather took me out on the land and taught me about the history and taught me about the people of Saugeen, the Anishinaabe people that took in Bima Dashka, and accepted her as she was, um, that she was a member of the community, that she married the chief and this, you know, lovely romantic story of living happily ever after. But really that transmission of knowledge, the history, the stories, the love, all of that stuff that gets transmitted, that's what made me proud of who I am and made me proud of my name and made me proud of both sides of who I am. And so, Certainly, I always I die, identify as Nishnabe, but I am also Ukrainian, and I'm the best of both worlds, and I'm super proud to be here, and I'm so glad to hear you uh, tell your story. It's amazing, yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for having will there, me. Yeah, will there be a show that we could come and see soon? Uh, in Montreal, I'm trying to think. I'm actually, <laughs> I am working on uh, my first piece that is not like a burlesque piece. Um, so I was... Um, actually at the studio today with uh, another Indigenous dancer, uh, uh, my dance partner, Simic, um, and we're working on a piece uh, just about love and Indigenous love. And awesome. yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because again, it's like in a completely new field. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I really, I think that's the thing. I just don't like being comfortable ever. I never want to be comfortable. So it's definitely scary. So we're in a creation period. Uh, I'm trying to think. In Montreal. Oh, yes, there are shows in Montreal. There's something called the Bal Burlesque in March. Uh, and that's going to be at Be Mathieu. Um, and I will be doing, I forgot to talk about this. I also do, uh, I do straps, which is a circus, an aerial circus thing. So I'm going to be doing an act that has straps in it. So if you want to come and see that, that will be in March. Uh, be next week. Great, yeah. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. How's our time, Aiden? Uh, we were scheduled 5.30, so... Oh, great. Anybody on Zoom have any questions? I know I saw Sonia out there. Sonia, do you have any questions from Zoom land? Oh, I don't see Sonia on there. She's gone. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how about... I do have a question. How do we make space or hold space for young people who are coming up? What are some kind of maybe solutions that we could maybe introduce into our lives at Concordia, in our communities? Okay. Oh, yeah. Anywhere. <laughs> um, I think there's, well, I want to just throw this word around, but like it is so important to like decolonize academia and these higher learning spaces um, and it's challenging right because I think we are in a cultural shift globally and that is at times scary it can feel like the world is on fire 
But I think there's real beauty in all these heavy, hard conversations that we're having, all these discoveries and truths that are coming out, um, maybe not necessarily uh, coming out for us, <laughs> but for the rest of our, you know, our brothers and sisters, it is uh, kind of an eye-opening time uh, and that can be challenging and frustrating um, and difficult to have these kind of conversations because um, feeling like we're doing wrong and we're not, you know, nobody likes to hear that. Um, I can share my personal experience. Uh, when I was 19, I applied to McGill uh, in the law faculty and I was, I did not have a bachelor's degree. I was coming right out of CJEP and I had to go through an interview process. And it was the first year that they did that because they wanted to change the kind of schematic of the majority being white male fifth generation lawyers. And it's a very tiny faculty. There was like 120 seats and like thousands of applicants for these 120 seats. So there's an interview process. And I think I was going to get it because I, I just, I didn't have the credentials. I did a deck in health science at Dawson. So I go in and I just really relaxed asking questions, talking about my experience, and I was just talking about my community. And that's what really sparked my interest in law because I really, really wanted to make change, like foundational change. And um, they really, really liked what I had to say. So the next day, the dean um, at the time, was, her name was Charmaine Lynn, and she was amazing. Um, and she called me and she goes, Lauren, I'd like to invite you to, to study law at McGill. And I was like, wow, I can't believe I did it. I'm gonna, so I, I accepted. I was actually signed up at Concordia. <laughs> I had to, I had to <laughs> so I, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do my law degree at McGill. Um, so I do the first year and I'm struggling. I am having the hardest time because what had happened was they had opened up 20 seats and I found out this, this year was like kind of an experimental year. They opened up 20 seats to people that had like non-traditional paths into law. So people that were coming from CJ, people that didn't have a bachelor's in poli sci or business. Um, Cause it's not, I don't think it's technically a, like a, a secondary degree, but most people have a bachelor's that, that go into law. So, um, and also I think unspoken, it was opened up to a lot of minority groups. So they wanted uh, to diverse and to women to diversify the faculty by 20 people. <laughs> so of the 20 people, we all were struggling. All of us were struggling. And I got called into the dean's office and she goes, Lauren, I want to talk to you about your grades. We really need to get your grades up. Um, what's, what's going on? And I'm like, well, I'm bartending four nights a week. Um, and I, um, I'm just, I'm sleeping. Like one of my shifts ended at five in the morning and I had a class at eight in the morning. So I'd go home, take a shower and I'd go right to, to class and then study at night and repeat, uh, sleeping just like hours and in the library and stuff like that. So she goes, you know, can you ask for money from your parents? <laughs> and that was kind of the solution. Can you just not work? And I said, absolutely not. Like I, I, nobody has any money. And I, you know, so I ended up, the solution was I had to take out a business loan. Um, and I did at 19, I was, I took out like a loan for a hundred thousand dollars to complete my education. And it ended up being that I just, the issue wasn't money. The issue was like foundational support, right? So that is something like, and I ended up dropping out in my second year. And then, I mean, I no regrets, as the kids say, because I, <laughs> I went full into arts. Uh, I ended up coming back to Concordia and studying arts. And I had the time of my life here. Um, but it was really eye-opening. Um, and yesterday I ran into my little cousin, who's also from Gunawage, and she's, now at law at McGill. And I said, how are you doing? How are you? And she's like, and she's like, Lauren, you would not believe the changes that they've made since you've been there. She's like, we have to take indigenous law as like integrated into every single class. Um, there's check-ins with all of the indigenous students every single day. And there's like more than one person. <laughs> so I'm like, I think it was very, like the intentions were very good when I was let into McGill. But I think that just like the, the structural support for indigenous students needs to also be there, right? And it's economic and social and like just understanding um, things like intergenerational trauma and how that affects families and that affects like sleep schedules and work schedules and all this stuff. It's so connected. Um, 
So yeah, I think it just lots of just continue to learn, <laughs> continue to learn and, and and be kind and gentle with yourself as well, because it is difficult to know what to do or what to say. Um, and also ask questions. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Very long-winded stories. No, I like those. I love the stories. I see Aiden over there. What's up, Aiden? Have you got a question for us? I don't know. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. I do. <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, so you talked about dancing being medicinal. Maybe can you expand more on that? Like, how does, how is dancing medicinal? Medicinal? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, for me, um, yeah, I think you're talking about different parts of our, our, our backgrounds, right? So like on my mother's side, it's from both sides of my family, I have this kind of approach. Um, on my mother's side, the Mohawk, um, and we have lots of traditional dances, lots of uh, social dances. So sorry. Um, and some of the dances like, are ceremonial, right? So we have, um, like if you have pow dances, jingle dances, like often the dance that a lot of people ascribe to medicinal dancing, right? It's a healing dance and it's a prayer dance. Um, so yeah, I think that that is something that like on that side of the family, that's always been like spoken, like dance is medicinal. On my father's side of the family, um, my father is a uh, Southern, uh, and black, uh, but on my grandmother's side, they're Haitian, um, and a lot of the traditional dancing on that side um, is on the, like a very medicinal, <laughs> very uh, there is almost um, like possession dancing or spirit dancing, which is like a big part of some of those practices. Um, so yeah, it's almost like I will say that I've seen things on both sides of my family that have really um, made me quite a spiritual person, things that like, um, yeah, I, I will share a small story about a, a ceremony that I, I saw when I was seven um, and a dance that I saw that I was seven that really shook me to the core. Cause again, I grew up in many different cultures and different religions. My grandmother was Catholic um, and my mother, was a Jehovah's Witness for a long time. So, uh, and my grandfather was the only one that was really traditional. So in the, in my home, I had to go to church on Sundays. I had to go to Kingdom Hall on Saturday. <laughs> and then I would go to ceremony with my grandfather. <laughs> so I was very confused. And um, my grandfather passed. My grandmother got called to the longhouse. And uh, uh, they asked for only the women to go. And it was in the middle of winter. Um, and they were doing... Uh, like a Hadoui ceremony or like a, a false face ceremony. And this is a secret mask society. Um, and it's not something that most people will get to see in their lifetime. It's not like a, I had heard about them and it was something I was seven and it, they scared me because they are these kind of um, very powerful spirits that are uh, doctor spirits, um, medicine spirits. So, you have these dancers that would go out into the snow and they left for about half an hour while the ceremony um, continued. My grandmother was sitting around a fire and we were all sitting around this fire and they came back in and they were wearing the masks and the way their bodies contorted and the sounds that they were making and watching them stick their hands into the fire and pull out ash and watching this like hot ember turn to ash and like then putting that on my grandmother. It was terrifying and beautiful. But then in that moment, I understood like their responsibility, these, these men, these dancers, their responsibility, they were vessels for this spirit, for this medicine to come through. Um, and that's like a really big part of right? our culture, like Iroquois culture is if you are part of one of these societies, the way that you have to live your life um, free of, alcohol, drugs, like smoking, like it's like almost like sainthood, right? And it's because you have to keep your body clean so that you are strong enough for like the spirit and the medicine to come through you and so that you can help people and also take on other people's sickness. Um, so quite literally, I've seen dances that have been medicinal. Um, and yeah, I just it's something that's really stuck with me from childhood that it's, it's um, 
literally that but then also like there's this other component where like through burlesque i was able to work out like lots of trauma lots of sexual trauma um i was able it was a safe space for me at 18 years old to um explore my sexuality from a place that was like protected right i was actually creating a character and a barrier where i could create and really i had no idea who i was at 18. And like, I was very fortunate to find this type of dance at the age that I did because like Lulu and Lauren grew together. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I have friends that are in their forties that are, are not really attuned or haven't worked through that kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, so like, I think any dance can be medicinal, but. Yeah, dancing is medicinal. <laughs> no, it is for me too. One. So one of the things that I was talking with my history students about this year is about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess how we think about the whole person, right? So that there's, there's the spiritual, the mental, emotional, the physical. So dancing, especially our traditional dancing, hits all of those spots for us. So certainly there's that physical, it's good for your body. Um, but it also helps us clear stress from our mind. Um, there's a connection that happens, one, between all of the dancers that are dancing with you, but you also connect with the drum and the singers at the drum. And we can almost have a conversation with each other. So if the drum's going too slow for the jiggle dress dancers, I'll give them a sign like speed it up and then they'll know to do that. Or if it's too fast, they'll know to just write a little signal like they will back the song off. So. Right, we're having these conversations out there. Um, but even more, sometimes they'll sing a song that does something like to your spirit and like forces you to dance. You cannot control your body. Your body has to dance and, and dance whatever way it wants to. That's a super, super awesome feeling. Um, but not all songs are like that. Our song makers are gifted. They can hear songs in the wind or in raindrops and how the rain falls and they make these songs from how they interpret the sounds in the environment. And that's their gift. I cannot do that. And I don't know many people that can, but those people who are gifted to do that, that adds to that, the power of that song and that song's ability to pull movement out of me and, and whatever in certain ways. So it is really, really spiritual and powerful. The other thing that happens is when I'm dancing, I can feel that I like my grandma's words and her messages to me. Uh, my grandma same, like always telling me to dance, dance for people who can't dance. So my grandma went to Spanish um, residential school um, and her whole life, although she always made us dance, she would never dance. And it wasn't until really, really late in her life that she could get up the, I guess the nerve or the ability, the, the courage to come and dance. But she talked to me a lot about how residential schools affected their, her pride um, and her identity. And it caused a lot of shame in her. So it made her really proud to see her grandkids dancing. But it was still something like so deeply ingrained in her at the residential school that it was something that dancing was something she couldn't do. But eventually, way, way late in her life, um, she did eventually come into the circle and dance. Um, and it was amazing and beautiful and you know um i miss my gram every day so when i'm dancing i always remember my grandma and i feel like she's there with me so there's lots of dancing works in lots of ways um as a medicine um to heal us but also um as a way to perpetuate that energy keep it going and then hopefully those young kids will see us old gals dancing and how cool <laughs> this one's outfits look um, but that the young kids will want to be a part of our culture and they'll want to dance Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I noticed this summer at the Powell's is that one, I saw women taking new spaces. So for me, I got to be the first uh, female MC at Cape Croker Powell, which was super cool because that's a space that women don't usually hold. But there were other women doing the same kinds of things, right? There was um, Jazz Phillips was the arena director at, at down at Chippewa the Thames. Uh, so there's women were taking different roles, but I also saw two spirited people stepping into new roles. So this really awesome young dancer who, who you know, he wore jingle dress this summer, 
um, and didn't dance like women. They danced their own style. And it was amazing, amazing to see this. But I could also see some of the older folks at the Powell weren't receptive to this new change. And so I want to encourage those young people out there, don't give up, keep dancing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll hold your space. I'll hold your space for you. I will stick up for you mm -hmm. and back you up. Because if I'm saying this to all the Powell people out there who might be listening, we have to change what we're doing. We need to make sure that we have spaces for young people to feel comfortable and welcome. We need new dance categories. Mm -hmm. um, we need to respect the switch dance. Um, all of these things we have to change. And then also that women are taking and moving into these new roles. Um, and let's celebrate that. And because I do see that as um, often men feel that, right, that they're being pushed out and they're not. But it's, we need men to also move into these new roles too and maybe take some of those roles that have typically been only women's spaces. Um, so we need lots of movement, lots of... Um, acceptance and tolerance for sure. And uh, yeah, I just wanna make sure that our powwows and our culture is a space where young people wanna be a part of. That way we've got, it's gonna keep going, right? Mm -hmm. And I think your dancing is super exciting, oh, super exciting. <laughs> and I'm so glad to meet you and to hear your awesome stories and your good words. <laughs> You're an amazing artist. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Did you wanna ask a question, Alan? I just kept talking, I could see you over there, but I'd like to my students, I'd just look the other direction. And then, I'd, <laughs> just kidding, I don't do that to them. I don't. Uh, I think that was, a, <laughs> I really think that was a perfect way to wrap up this. Yeah, event. did I? I mean, awesome. Uh, there's been a really, uh, this has really been amazing. I think we can all agree that we can just sit down here and listen to a lot more. Um, but thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing your experiences yes. and bringing some of your artwork here. And <laughs> I just want to say a huge thank you to my team, Alan and Juliet, for helping this event come to come to play and for Fourth Space for setting this all up. And again, thank you so much, Lauren, and yeah. for you, Bimadushka, for sharing your stories. Yeah. Uh, this has really yeah. been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Ami Gwech. Ami See you next year. Rock Your Mox 2023. <laughs> If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at CU Fourth Space. We'd love to hear from you. The Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffin, and produced with Anna Vaklebeck. Editing by Chanel Lees Marshall and Maximus Delmar. And our theme music, courtesy of Supercontinent. Thanks for listening.